thing I've noticed during my short time exploring the independent tabletop game scene is that almost everyone who plays indie games also makes indie games. Maybe it's jumping into a game jam and hacking their favorite system. Maybe it's cleaning up some prep notes from a home game and releasing an adventure for others to run. Maybe it's a fully illustrated rulebook with professional layout and editing. The quality and scope of files up on Itch.io varies dramatically, but the fact is people love making games. The current industry of tabletop games is a mess, but the thing that endears me so deeply to indie games is that they are, by and large, labors of love. Untitled Moth Game is certainly no exception. Combining two existing SRDs, revamping the Taroka deck from the 5e adventure Curse of Strahd, and ultimately releasing the game as a birthday present for a friend, designer S. Kaya J has exemplified the creative spirit of independent games. Drawing inspirations as classic as fairy tales and as modern as Untitled Goose Game, UMG is a deceptively difficult journaling game structured with an intentionality that belies its purpose as a gift between friends. The game begins in typical fairy tale fashion. Once upon a time, there is a maiden who dwelt with her true love. From there, we get the premise of the game. The true love is captured by a tyrant who lives in a castle, transformed into a ghost, while the maiden becomes a were-moth, cursed to fly by night. The maiden's challenge is made explicit. She must rescue her love from the castle, gathering power and memories from her neighbors in the village, until she has the strength to confront the Dark Lord. It's a simple premise, but an effective one for conveying the surreal, dreamlike qualities of a fairy tale, or story working in the gothic genre. During my interview with Kaya, she explained that this game's lore actually grows out of the Taroka deck from Curse of Strahd. Kaya wanted to expand upon the mythology of the cards in the module, frustrated that, in the context of the adventure, they were only ever used to highlight locations and characters, and never made much use of their interesting backstories. That premise was a starting point, but she drew inspiration from darker stories as well, specifically traditional Russian folktales and the collections of the Brothers Grimm. The result are prompts that feel heavy with purpose, featuring an array of colorful characters that could have stumbled out of a number of legends. Similarly, the game's tone tinges characters' problems with the precarity of their fables. One bad turn has hurtled them toward catastrophe, and now they trust your maiden to seek their redemption within the castle's high walls. In contrast with Untitled Goose Game, from which the text takes its name, your task is to solve your town's various struggles, not escalate them. Untitled Moth Game is a journaling game built on a combination of Peach Garden Games' Carta SRD and Fari RPG's Breathless SRD. Divided into two phases, players first explore a village, gathering resources and collecting memories, until they are whisked away to the castle, where they brave challenges and either rescue their lost love, or, far more likely, break their promise to save them. The Carta SRD forms the backbone of the game's structure. Players explore a card map and answer prompts based on the cards they uncover. However, players must also work with a set of six skills, three in their maiden form, and three in their moth form. These skills are each allotted a polyhedral die, which, in keeping with the breathless formula, degrade a step each time they're used. The core tension in the game is how to keep those skills meaningful, as they refresh to their original die value after you switch between forms. Furthermore, depending on what phase of the game you're in, you'll need to spend the Moonlight resource to make that transformation. This might seem fairly standard, most tabletop games have some form of resource expenditure in order to access abilities, but because of the limitations of the village and the castle, you'll soon learn just how scarce your Moonlight points can be. In the village, the rule set is forgiving, encouraging exploration, incentivizing players to search throughout the 25 card spread as much as they can. The spread consists of a random assortment of cards from the low deck, which are basically the four suits, numbered 1 through 10, and the high deck, which are like Tarot's high arcana archetypes. In UMG, a low deck card presents you with a challenge, which you must use one of your skills to overcome. Mechanically, this means meeting or exceeding the value of the low deck card with your dice roll. By contrast, high deck cards are nearly always beneficial, granting powerful items that can be used in place of checks, additional moonlight for transformations, or even a permanent increase in the value of one of your skill dice. This matters in the village phase, because every successful low deck challenge completed will yield a reward. If you're in moth form, you gain moonlight points, and if you're in maiden form, you gain memories, which narratively are the stories of the villagers, 
each of which have some sort of grievance with the Tyra in the castle. Your memories act as an additional resource in the second phase of the game. They're essentially hit points. If you fail a skill challenge in the castle phase, you lose a memory. And if you run out of memories, it's game over. But the nice thing about the village phase is that there's essentially no penalty for failing. You don't spend moonlight when you transform from maiden to moth, you don't lose memories for losing a skill challenge, and you always collect a reward if you do succeed. However, you'll eventually trigger the castle phase. Everything about exploring the castle is dangerous and confusing, absolutely designed to expend your resources and confound you at every turn. Just look at the layout of the castle as compared to the village. Notice something weird? The castle doesn't start with its full deck spread out, because you have to uncover portions of the castle as you play, with prompts resetting once you get far enough away from them. Backtracking means you'll have to replay the same prompt, which, if it's a low deck card, means you'll have to keep burning your skills and resources, whittling away your chances at success. Furthermore, every transformation now burns moonlight, meaning those skill refreshes are going to come at a steep cost. The castle is an absolute gauntlet, no matter how you slice it. Assuming an equal skill distribution between Maiden and Moth form, your average die roll values are roughly going to come out to 3.3, which is a problem, because the average value of a low card is 5.5. You're mechanically at a huge disadvantage from the jump, and to make matters worse, you have an equal chance of saving your beloved as you have at uncovering the Dark Lord, a card that, if you draw it, means you have to restart the entire phase, eating the cost of the resources you've already sacrificed. Reading UMG, doing a double take, and then checking my math, I was kind of shocked at just how difficult this game is to win. When I first read Kaya's description, I assumed it would be a low-stakes prompt game, a relaxing tool to help players illustrate a moth-themed fairy tale. But after speaking with her, I learned this mismatch was not a mistake at all. UMG's classic inspirations are not the Disney versions that promise a happily ever after. She cited the wild swigginess of old stories, of how life-altering curses can wreck a realm for a generation, how a completely unrelated and non-established character can appear in the third act, if we can even really impose a three-act structure onto centuries-old stories, completely changing the course of the narrative. There is the possibility of a happy ending, but it is by no means guaranteed. The cards fall where they may, and, in fairy tales as in life, your fate depends more on the luck of the draw than your own heroic efforts. I struggle to reconcile Untitled Moth Game's gentle presentation with the harsh reality of its mechanics. Adding Breathless's horror underpinnings to the Carta system's exploration framework is pretty inspired as a game design choice but I still can't imagine how it must feel to watch your promises and dice dwindle down to fuzzy nubs, all to stumble upon the Dark Lord card halfway through the castle. But that is, of course, the point. It's hard to be critical of the game's punishing structure when it's supposed to be as fickle as the Fae themselves. The most endearing quality of this game to me is, for all its difficulty spikes and random lucky twists, it's a game made for two people. The text is dedicated to game designer Cassie Mothwin and her partner Joshua Peters, born of a chat one night between Kaya and her friends, delivered on Mothwin's birthday. And that's… kind of incredible, right? I'm not saying that indie game designers don't deserve to be paid, or that everyone who works for a larger corporation is a sellout. But there is something so genuinely heartfelt about writing thousands of words of prompts about innovating on a pre-existing system to create an impressive standalone game, wholly as a present for a friend. Game making resources have become increasingly accessible in the last few years. Free software like GIMP and Canva can help aspiring designers do layouts and illustrations. Every few weeks I'll see someone post about a new writing tip or tool catalog they've released. That accessibility has saturated the hobby which is understandably frustrating for people who want their voices to be heard. I certainly wish that more respect and attention were paid to folks doing innovative and weird stuff for an audience of dozens. But I think works like Untitled Moth Game are a reminder that there is joy in creation for its own sake, that labor in service of friendship is to be cherished. For me, there is no more honest way to say I love you. You should pick up UMG. Let's pay what you out on itch. And it's worth reading just for the experience of seeing a seamless blend of the Carta and Breathless systems. But more than that, I hope it inspires you to think about your own friends, 
about how life is weird and messy and catastrophic, and there's never a bad time to tell people how much they mean to you. Tabletop games rule. Indie games rule. Make games for your friends because you love them. The only happy endings are the ones we build every morning. Hey everybody, thank you so much for taking the time to get to the end of this video. I work really hard on them, and um, I even interviewed the designer, which I usually don't do, but uh, Kai was very gracious with her time, and I really appreciate that she uh, took some time out of her schedule to, to speak with me, because um, it really helped inform the review. I think it made it better. Um, anyway, if you want to find more of my work, I'm at AaronSXL on Twitter. My main website is aavoit.com, and I mostly talk about games, writing, and health policy. Uh, I also do two podcasts. The first is at Mortified Pod, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. Um, we just talked about the new um, Witch in Mercury from Gundam. That was really interesting. Um, and we all, I also do another podcast with my friends, uh, Michael and Josh, that's at The Bible Boys, where um, we check out Christian media. Um, we are getting close to our 100th episode where we review uh, God's Not Dead again, which is a, a sick favorite of mine. Um, so if those seem like something you might be interested in, please check them out. Thanks as always for watching. I hope to have another video out in a couple weeks. Uh, until then, uh, see ya!